and Claire, how are you today? <laughs> I'm good. Hi, Meg. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm a little tired. So are you too tired because you slept too much? Do you have tired face when you sleep longer than usual? Probably. I think I only sleep longer than usual when it's hard for me to wake up. So that I think that means I'm more tired than usual. Huh. That makes sense. Sort of. Like I know that when I sleep particularly more than I usually do, I have the hardest time waking up. It just feels like my body is made out of lead and my, my face is puffy. My fingers are puffy. It feels like everything's a struggle. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know why. Like, I'm not sure if it has to do with how tired I am. I think it's just, I don't know. Believe it or not, this is one area of life I have not spent enough time overthinking yet. Sleep? Yeah. <laughs> That's a huge area of life. That's a third of your life. No, I know, but I mean, like, I kind of try to approach it with this is stuff that works well for my sleep hygiene. This is where I know it gets like <laughs> really questionable. And this is how much I know is ideal. And I sort of stick to that. And I try to not overthink why sometimes I wake up and I feel meh. Because if I overthink another topic in my life, it's just I have a, enough topics to overthink about. <laughs> mm -hmm. I completely agree. I never overthink my sleep. When I was a kid, I used to, and then I made this big drastic shift of not caring. So well, how did you overthink your sleep when you were a kid? So I had these like intense bedtime rituals where I would like pee 10 times and I had to make sure my sister was that we shared a room. So we had to both like make sure we were settled in and, you know, it's just like a overthinking the routine, I think. Aww. And then also at sleepovers with friends, I would get so anxious about making sure I actually slept. I was like that kid who would get annoyed. I'd be like, guys, I need to sleep. And everyone's like having a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see the progress I've made in life? Now I'm like, I don't care if I don't fall asleep. I'd rather have fun. But like back then I would be like the kid calling their mom at like 2 a.m. Mom, I can't sleep. Can you come pick me up? You know, like. Oh, um, and then I think it was college when the fast lifestyle of college, like I was going out a lot and stuff. And I just realized at some point I was like, I've had many nights where I <clears throat> didn't have great sleep and I was fine. And if I miss out on getting good sleep, I'll recover fine the next day. So there's no need to worry about it. So it's like magic. It life was happening in the night. So you needed to be present for the night. Life was <laughs> happening. Yeah, life was happening in the night. But I think it taught me that you don't need to make bedtime like this magical routine. Just sometimes you can't. Like everything in life, it's important to be flexible about so many things. I also think that when we're young, we can afford to do that in a different way than yeah, later on. True. Like, I remember like student years when I was a young professional <laughs> in the finances industry, I remember being able to like party late, have fun late, work super late, and then wake up early and still be like, I'm good to go. Like imagine, I remember I used to work for a firm for which I would travel abroad. And I remember having a job for which I had to fly to the US. And obviously the US is behind Europe, right? In terms of time. And I remember that specific year where it was such a busy time at work. And I was sort of like managing little teams. And I remember <laughs> working the day in the US, working really late into the night, and then sending my last emails for my night when people in Belgium were starting the day. <laughs> absurd. So absurd. Yeah, wow. I'm not doing that anymore. I, I would actually not do very well. Like I'm past 30 mm -hmm. and I've decided that I am granting myself permission to decide that I'm old and I get to have my sleep time <laughs> or else I'm not functioning. I love sleep. I cherish sleep. So mm -hmm. I'm right there with you. I would consider it, I say, um, resting is a skill. Oh, yeah. To my clients, I tell them resting is a skill because a lot of people see it as like 
a weakness or something like that, but it's really a skill. And I feel like giving yourself permission to have extra sleep when you need it, not being too strict on yourself is important too. And you're right. Like it's important to not wellnessify it. I don't know. <laughs> like this is not yeah. a girl that like healthify it. Yeah, as much as we know that there are ways to sort of help ourselves to have a better night of sleep and yes, like sleeping enough is going to be helpful. We don't need to get destructive about something that's supposed to be helpful, you know, when we approach the whole like sleep thing. Flexibility, definitely a thing here. <laughs> and yeah. new thing that I've discovered with age is how important what happens first thing in the morning is. Yeah. Yep. I used to be like up, go, <laughs> like alarm on. And I would have like an alarm, like I would have several alarms and there would be the exact number of minutes for me to be like at the next task. Like I get up at this time, 12 minutes later, I'm done with my shower, brushing my teeth. And then another 12 minutes later, I'm out the door, literally 24 minutes getting up, being out the door to go to work. <laughs> it's crazy. But now I'm learning how much power there is in actually going to sleep at a more reasonable time, waking up and starting in a much more mindful way, not in like go, go, go <laughs> mode. I'm trying. It's so important to be able to do everything I didn't do today, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but seriously, usually I do wake up slow and chill and I try to do my journaling, maybe some gentle movement, like wake up and chat a little with the fam in the morning. It's nice, relaxing, have good breakfast. It makes a difference. It really does. Yeah. Anyway, that was and not the question for today though. No, <laughs> just a tangent about sleep. So here's our opinions about sleep <laughs> from humans, not professionals. Clearly, none of us is a sleep professional. <laughs> I'd love to volunteer to be one, though. No, I'm just kidding. I could just sleep professionally. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That'd probably get sort of boring. And I have no idea how that would even work, to be honest. They probably just monitor your sleep for science. <laughs> <laughs> okay then you have like things attached to you and then uh, yeah then I would probably start overthinking my sleep definitely yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Really. true it's a no. all right so woohoo let's talk about our question of the day question of the day is what was the hardest part for you in recovery and when did it click Oh, great question. And you know, it's funny because I know that you and I have like very different experiences with this. So I'm excited for us to both dive in. Recovery was so difficult. The most difficult when the behaviors were at, you know, the most intense and most frequent and the most automated, right? I had anorexia with the binge purge subtype. So that can get really chaotic and those behaviors can just run your world. And the hardest part was experiencing that. First of all, living in that in a very automated way where nothing is staying down. You know, it's just very bad. I would say what clicked and honestly, the most game changing point for me was when I decided to, instead of using the behavior, so I recognize I want to stop this right? This is actually gross. That was a huge motivator for me. I was like, this is gross. <laughs> That's my healthy self saying like, stop this behavior. You don't like it. So I was really motivated. I wanted to stop. And I knew that even though it was automated, there was a part of me that was still taking action I could intervene in. So essentially there was a moment where I just decided to remove myself from the bathroom essentially and ride the wave of discomfort. And honestly, it felt uncomfortable physically and emotionally. 
but I got through it. You know, I sat through it. I felt the feels. I felt whatever shame was coming up, fear, anxiety. And then it just dissipated and it clicked for me. That made me feel really good. And my healthy self was in a place where that would feel good for me, right? Mm -hmm. So I felt an immediate reward almost for not using the behavior. Huh, that's that's so interesting. Yeah, like I felt proud of myself. Mm. But sometimes it's hard to access the I'm proud of myself thing. Like sometimes it's the only thing that feels like it's ever going to help is the behavior, right? And so it's like, I don't know, it's it's so interesting to hear that, that even in the short term, you manage to connect to this feeling of this is right. This is actually what I want to be doing. And I'm feeling proud of myself for choosing this this time. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that's not the case for everyone. And I know that we all use behaviors for a while because it feels better to use the behavior than to ride out the discomfort. It's still delayed gratification, even though it's a matter of maybe five to 10 minutes. Choosing to sit through the discomfort and feel proud of yourself after is still a form of delayed gratification in a way because you're like, I didn't do the cheap shot behavior that gives me the quick thrill, the quick high, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I didn't choose that to feel better. Yeah. Cause like, it feels like you decided, like, I really don't like this. Yeah. I was thoroughly grossed out. Like there was one day I woke up and I was like, I'm repulsed by this. So Mm -hmm. I decided, I did make a decision. What are your thoughts? You're like, (laughs) you're speechless. No, it's just like, I feel so much compassion for like, you know, past Meg, because I can understand where that comes from. At the same time, it's so interesting because like it goes to show how we're all so different, right? Like for you being so harsh with that other part of you allowed you to take that step. But at the same time, sometimes we have to sort of actually, instead of being so harsh, because it feels like your healthy self was judging. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For your choice. And usually when we talk about judgment, we tend to be like, oh, let's take a step back because judging tends to be, you know, the typical behavior of our eating disorder. But in this case, it was sort of like judgment that sort of like pushed you in the right direction in the sense that even though it sounded quite harsh, it had, I guess, an intention that was aligned with who you really wanted to be. I haven't thought of it that way. Like, yeah, my healthy self was judging the crap out of my eating disorder, like the whole time. I was not trying to be that girl. Like I never got the identity thing where the ED became my identity. I wanted nothing to do with the eating disorder identity. And I think that comes back to American health class where they make women with bulimia seem really deranged. And like in all the videos, it's just like very scary. I don't know if We had like a very intense eating disorders health class. I actually remember watching it and being like, wow, those, those people are really messed up. I'll never be that. And then it's like, I ended up being that person. So I think I had that coming into it. And I was just like, I don't want to be this. My healthy self was judging the eating disorder harshly. And I'll say this your healthy self can have a little attitude sometimes and that's okay. And I think people need to see that. Like this is a little tangent, but when I talk about self-compassion with someone who freaking feels like they don't deserve it and hates self-compassion and they can't connect to it, it's often because they hear, they think their healthy self needs to sound like, Oh, sweetie, it's okay. Like talking to them, like they're a baby. But in reality, your healthy self can just sound like an argumentative friend who has your back and being like fighting against the eating disorder self, right? Your healthy self can have more of a tood than we all make it sound sometimes. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes that's easier to access if you have a lot of anger towards the ED or anger towards yourself. So I don't know, something to think about. I mean, we know that there's no cookie cutter approach to anything in recovery and there's no one best way to approach things, rarely at least. 
I feel like there are many topics that we bump into in one way or another, but the order in which we bump into them is going to be different, wildly different from one client to another. Like self-compassion, for example, is something that is either easily accessible to someone or we're not going to touch it, but then we're going to keep stumbling into it sort of accidentally. And I'm going to be pointing out that, you know what you're doing here, that's self-compassion. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, oh, <laughs> that's not what I expected. I'm like, yeah, no worries. Like, I'm just letting you know. And then we can still dive into self-compassion in another time because we do stumble across it at some, like in practice because yeah. I mean, we talked about this, I think, already once or twice. I talk about self-compassion yeah. every day. This is like my theme of everything I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, <laughs> stumble across it, even just because it's logical. Yeah, you know, well. In many ways. But like you said, it doesn't sound like always like the sweet, sweet voice. Like the energy of self-compassion to an extent is like the energy of a parent. You know, it has boundaries. It knows the direction. It's going to be like, listen, I'm not going to hate you. I still love you unconditionally, but you got to get your shit together. <laughs> you know, sort of yes. a thing. That's really the energy that I see in self-compassion. It's like, you failed this class. This is important. Without this, you don't get like, I don't know, a high school degree. This is important for your future. So I'm not going to say it's fine. It's no big deal. It is a big deal, but I'm not going to hate you or like bash you or tell you how much of a piece of shit you are, because that's not going to help you get there. But I'm going to tell you the reality of things, which is you need that for your future. And you said that you wanted that. So how can we get there? Yeah. That's the energy of self-compassion. And then it has like the more loving mother sometimes, the more like harsh, you know, like what are you doing? <laughs> energy. But I don't know. I like sort of giving that example or that vibe to it. Yes. Yes. I actually have a client who clicks into her healthy self thinking about when she was a parent raising a teenager. Cool. So that yeah. Interesting. Like we can tap into the compassionate boundary setting, protective version of herself by reflecting back on that. So I've seen that in real life mm -hmm. in action. Yeah. So for those of you who feel weird about compassion, what are you stereotyping? Like, are you making compassion make you feel like you're being babied or, you know, there's so many different energies of self-compassion mm -hmm. that are more palatable and tolerable and accessible within your world. So anyway, another great tangent, but Anne Claire, what was your worst part of your eating disorder and how did you, what was the second half get through that? What clicked? Well, I had plenty more questions for you. <laughs> this is not fair. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone on too long about me. We need to go on about you. Hold on. Can I ask just one question? Okay. You said, basically, the big thing was I made this decision. Then I tolerated the discomfort for long enough until the pressure to have to use the behavior fizzled out. And yeah. then that basically created a new version of the norm for you, something that was accessible for you to choose. And I'm yeah. just wondering if there's anything particular that you did or that you would, you know, sort of share as a tip, as a coach for anyone who's like, but I can't do the tolerating in the moment and the waiting. It's like, what do you do during that time? Right. When you yeah. remove yourself from the bathroom, you were mentioning, what were you doing? How did you not just rush back in? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I remember doing a lot of breathing because I was actually nauseous. So like breathing through it was really the main, this was over a decade ago now. So about a decade ago. So it's hard to remember everything. And I was not going through recovery in a conscious way. So like if I was using coping skills, I didn't even have the words for it, mm -hmm. but I definitely know I was breathing a lot. I refused to go back into the bathroom. And I'll say like, there were moments after that turning point where I did use behaviors again, because it's an up and down process where maybe it turns into, okay, you're doing behaviors only half the time you feel the urge and then it's less and less and less. So yeah, it became an option for me after mm -hmm. that turning point. And so just remember breathing and like laying down and taking it easy and just giving it time. There was nothing fancy happening as far as like big time breathing skills or like 
distractions. I just think I really just kept the body relaxed as best as I could. Yeah, that was basically it for me. And what are you like your few top tips that you would recommend for anyone who's like, okay, I'm going to try to like postpone, like not reach for this behavior for a oh, while. Yeah. And it out. Well, I think one thing that I love that we're taught in coaching that I ask my clients to do a lot is using the timer, just seeing if you could delay using a behavior for X amount of time. So this can be applied to anything, not just purging, but it can be applied to like weighing yourself or, you know, anything really just seeing, can I add space between my urge and the behavior itself? So start with two minutes. You might feel good just being able to delay it and then stretching it out to 10 and then stretching it out to 15. And then suddenly within that time, you feel better. And then you know, after the time's up, you realize I don't really need to use this behavior anymore. That one is a great one for anyone who needs a tip, right? And then honestly, connecting to the healthy self in terms of why you hate the behavior, like really, that was huge for me. I was leaning into judging the behavior. Like you said, I was like, this is off. Like, I don't like these physical symptoms. I don't like anything about it, the nausea, the disgusting behavior, leaning into and recognizing and seeing it for what it is really helped me being like, I need to stop this. That's not really a tip, but if you want to look at your behavior through the lens of judgment, maybe could help you, but there's a lot you can do. Leaving the environment again, leaving the environment, going outside, you know, reading a book outside, gentle walk outside, calling a friend. Those are also very good things that will break the state. Mm -hmm. you. So you are essentially shaking up, you know, your immediate life and saying, yeah. okay, I'm going to call someone, reach out for help, right? Calling your coach, texting your coach or leaving the room, going outside is a great one. Yeah, I feel like both making the environment not accessible to you and talking to a human both sort of remove temporarily the option. You know what I mean? Like, because if we're saying wait it out in the next door room, for example, in the house and be with yourself, it's still so easy to go back. But if you're talking to someone, it's a bit harder to be like, okay, bye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That I do have to say, like my story with stopping using the behaviors, I lived in a sorority house with like 20 girls. So I'm sure there were moments where I would go back to my room and my roommate was there and we would just start blabbing or like mm -hmm. I would go into the hallway and find a friend. And so for me, it was very accessible to, as life coaches call it, break state. So if you're a state of like being stuck in your head, pulling yourself back to the present by just smiling at someone or yeah. saying hello can really help you get out of that. And it's a great distraction because, you know, if people aren't available to you or you can't just leave wherever you're at, or it's not a question of being in a specific place, distraction can be you with yourself, but it's not the same. And I feel like sometimes it becomes then easier to do the other thing you said, where it's like, just look at the thing in the eyes, like straight in the eyes and be like, <laughs> what do you want? Like, what am I actually doing here? And like brain dumping, like for the five minutes that you put the timer on, sometimes it's going to be enough to sort of like get it out of your system. Also when you write, I mean, for me, at least my thoughts go so fast that when I write, they have to go slower. <laughs> my hand doesn't go yeah. as fast as my brain. Yeah. And so I feel like when I brain dump, it really has that thing where it soothes my nervous system a yeah. lot. Yes. And then when you were doing the breathing, it sounds to me like you were bringing your body back to neutral, which is a really high end skill. I look back at my younger self. I'm very impressed with the stuff she was doing, honestly, honestly. But yeah, I think brain dump, like journaling, during the time you are feeling the urge, but not acting on the behavior. So say you do have the timer on, if you can brain dump and journal out all the thoughts you're having, a really cool thing you can do is bring that journal entry to your coach or to your therapist 
or anyone on your team and talk about the thoughts that you were experiencing in that moment. So you're going to see a lot of your eating disorder self on the page and you can challenge that after the fact. And that can be really helpful. Yeah. That's like one of the most direct sources to someone's eating disorder voice meaning the sort of self. Also, the last thing I wanted to say, because that works not for everyone, but for some people, if there is a space, like a physical place in your home, your apartment, your wherever, that is typically associated with behaviors, whether that's the bathroom or the kitchen or whatever, is to find what we call transitional objects. Oh, yeah, yeah. Object that's going to remind you of the commitment that you're making when you're going to see your therapist and your dietitian and your coach and you're having all these conversations and you're really trying hard to do the recovery thing. And that object can really start carrying that deep sense of value and be that reminder. And so I know that some of my clients have simply a post-it note, for example, on the mirror in the bathroom when they enter. Or they have the post-it notes on top of their, like on the fridge or on top of the cabinets near where they're cooking so that they have these little some things, or it can be like, I don't know, like little statue thingy or picture or whatever, but it can really help to sort of re-anchor into that intention that you have and that you're working so hard on. And that maybe feels less tangible because you have that urge, but then suddenly you see it and it's like, it's like something's shattering the glass a little bit, right? It's just like yeah. that little crack when you see it. And sometimes that's enough of a pause to break the pattern and be able to respond instead of react. Yeah, I love that. Such a good piece of advice too. So that was that. Anyways. Very cool. I only so had one. You owe, us, you owe us your story. Yeah. So hard my hardest, how did you, how hard. Did you I mean, I'm going to try to make it a short one, but my hardest part in recovery was emotions as a whole. It's just like, I was one of the humans that showed up in therapy and was asked, how are you doing? And I was like, good, bad, sad. I don't know. Like usually, oh, I don't know. Fine. <laughs> and the whole emotions thing, it was completely new. And so of course, like from the beginning, from the knowing that there are more than like two emotions, good and bad, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing it off now. Cause I can't like, I can look back and be like, Oh, but it really was hard for me. Like literally. So it's like the whole thing. Like my therapist was like, there are more emotions and I'm like, okay, if you say so, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and then she's like, I really recommend that you check in with yourself and you write down. And I was like, what journaling? Like I was not into journaling, not in any way whatsoever. And when she suggested journaling, I was like, I'm really not digging this idea at all. <laughs> Just not interested. I mean, I was like, okay, I'm curious, but I don't like the idea. And then she's like, okay, listen, how about we just do 30 second check-in? All you do is you write down how you feel. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> And I was like, okay. And then like, obviously she upgraded it to then do that when you use behaviors, keep track of your behaviors. And then, you know, because she was trying to actually start building understanding of patterns. Yeah. <laughs> this is me reflecting back. Of course, at the time I was like, okay, whatever. But like, I remember going home and being like, okay, so emotions and going and opening Google and being like emotions, like <laughs> give me a list. And I literally, what I did, and I found my old journals back not so long ago. Well, last year. And I would literally like wrote down a few more emotions that I thought, okay, I think I know what this could be like. And so I added them on the page on the first page of my journal. And I would like flip back and sort of be like, what could it be right now? And it's really interesting because when I would read through my old journal, I would see really like where I was trying to figure it out. Like I would put like an emotion and sometimes I would put in parentheses, like question mark being like, I think think maybe like <laughs> I'm just trying this new thing of observing nuances here and I would like continue adding to the list and so you can see like it's written in different pen you know colors and whatever because like I was adding to that list of being like okay what is this thing what does that sound like what does that feel like but yeah I was really starting nowhere with the whole wow. emotions thing and so like 
starting to notice what that's like, what that means, how I can respond to them, how I have a choice about what I do with them, <laughs> how they show up in my body as well, not just in how I think and talk to myself, and really creating that relationship with what was going on inside of me, whether we're talking about the head or the body, like I was completely disconnected from all of that. So emotions, that was hard. Also, it was hard because I didn't want to feel them. Let's be real. There's a reason I was so disconnected is because I did not want to be with the emotions. So going away from the numbness, it was really hard. And that's really the thing that kicked my butt over and over again, because that's when I lapsed. That's when things went backwards in my recovery. It's when things got bad and I got bad news or something was hard. Like I was faced with a hard emotion. I was like, no, 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 no. And I would run in the other direction, which was behaviors. So it was really, really hard. And as a human, I still think feelings are hard. I still believe that feeling, because I am a deeply feely human, Sometimes it's like, oh my God, like, can I just feel less intensely, please? Like, <laughs> and I mean, I'd say that with a lot of compassion for myself and I do allow myself to sit with the feelings, but it's not easy. I don't want it to sound like now I just like feel sadness and it's fine. And like, I feel anxiety and I'm cool with it. Like, I'm not cool with it, <laughs> but I know that I got to do the thing so that it can go through me instead of be like bottled up and explode in ways that are hurtful for my health and for people around me. So. So question, how did you tap into feeling like I'm thinking of the people who are so disconnected from their emotions that they kind of like intellectualize it. They're like, I'm sad. And they're like, they're not actually feeling it. Right. <laughs> like, How did you give yourself space to start to feel? Was it just the writing it down or did you so I started with just writing down something and then being okay because my therapist gave me permission to be wrong about the feelings. So she was like, I feel that. Yeah. Well, I couldn't do it for myself at the yeah, time. Yeah, I know, I know. So she was like trying to add a few options that you feel like, you know, intellectually what they would look like, right? If you're watching a movie, can you see anger in a human, right? Yeah, like, how would you act it? You know, can, can you see what that would look like or how that sounds like? And so I added a few and I tried to sort of consider saying that that's what I was feeling. And I allowed myself to be wrong about it. <laughs> and that's really how I looked at it. I was like, when I'm asking myself the question, I'm going to look at what's going on in my head. Like, what am I telling myself? What am I commenting on life? What am I mm. like? Am I saying I hate this blah because blah, in which case there could be some anger there. <laughs> Am I saying, I feel like shit, like this is like breaking my heart and I feel like gray and very blue. And I'm like, okay, so maybe this is more like sadness, right? Mm -hmm. And then I, I was really trying to be like, okay, what would that, if I was watching a movie, <laughs> what would this person be saying or sharing about? The link to the body thing, it came with practice, including my yoga practice. So mm -hmm. I started my yoga practice like again. So I had done yoga years before. And then I started again in recovery because my therapist basically told me just start doing something. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to start something <laughs> with that attitude and rolling my eyes, always rolling my eyes. I would do it though. I'm very stubborn, but I would roll my ass on the regular. And I started yoga again. And I was going to classes where they were really being like, we're going to pause and you're going to like connect to your physical presence in this place, right? And it's like, can you feel the earth under your bum cheeks and your feet? And it's like, okay, so far I can do that. And then they were like, how do you feel in your body? And then it's like, what do you mean? And then they're like, do you feel tension somewhere? Do you feel somewhere where it's relaxed? And it really like sort of helped me reconnect to like the other side, the non-intellectual side of things where I started being like, okay, I can feel that there's this thing in my hip that's a bit tense, but I'm feeling pretty okay in my arms. Like it was basic, but this was really where I started listening to what my body was maybe saying. Mm -hmm. And then of course they would start adding layers of how do you feel emotionally? And then I'd be like, 
like, and for a while I would just like skip that question. And that's also okay. But then I started being like, you know, cause there was a combo of, I had journaled maybe that morning and I had written maybe that I was feeling sad or overwhelmed. And then suddenly I was noticing that my body felt this way or that way. And mm. that starts linking things, right? Suddenly, unknowingly, you're linking observations that you made in another space and time. And then here I was on my mat making these other observations and it started making sense. To an extent, it happens unconsciously, like to a big extent, my yoga practice. Now I see it as such a massive contributor at the time. Definitely, like I didn't have that intention behind it. I was just showing up and I was just like, something feels good about this. I feel a bit clearer when I step off the mat. I know the classes where that's more the case. And I know the classes where it's less the case and just going with it and just trying to trust that something's happening. That's not too bad, but now I can see how powerful that was at that time where I was trying so hard to figure out what's going on and how is what's going on internally contributing to me using disordered behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you kind of spent so much time observing and making those connections and making the links. You're like building your own self-awareness there. Oh yeah. 100%. And then like, I know that one trap that I sort of fell into when I was doing that is sort of like only look at the gloomy and dark stuff. At some point, my therapist was like, you do know that you only write about these things. And I was like, well, that's true. <laughs> she was like, I'm not saying it's not true, but maybe there are other things that are also true. And I was like, that was a revelation. Like you can have two things that are true at the same time. And both <laughs> are them are not a lie. Like I can be truly 100% really feeling sad, stressed out and overwhelmed. And at the same time, I can also allow myself to observe. I have what I need. I have people, these few people around me that I love and that I care about, and there is nothing that's pointing to it's the end of the world. I did not lose my job. I am still alive. Like, you know, it seems so simple, but I would literally like, again, if I look back at my journals, there are entries upon entries where I was like checking in and how, for how I was feeling. And then it was like all bad. <laughs> and then I would write, and I also know that la, and I also see that la. And I would really like try to bring some balance in what I was allowing myself to be aware of because mm -hmm. I had fallen into the trap of being like, well, see, these are all good reasons to feel like shit <laughs> and use behaviors. There's nothing good. And she's like, well, are we actually looking at the whole picture here? <laughs> you know, I love that that shift for you was recognizing there's complexity to feeling emotions and layers mm -hmm. and how there's multiple emotions usually flowing in the background. And some can be good emotions and some can be negative emotions. And I think that helps a lot. Like, I really think that's a helpful distinction for everyone to hear is there can be feeling sadness and fear or whatever you have at the same time you can tap into gratitude you can tap into even moments of happiness right like you can have multiple things going on at once yeah and that's sophistication, the sophistication of Anne claire's emotional life just like slowly increasing i love seeing this it's just, it's baby steps. And, you know, it's normal that it happens this way. And I'm so glad and thankful for my therapist in the past because that whole concept of, you know, duality and like I can hold the different truths and the different things at the same time, it's still true now. And it's still so helpful for me now because I am a very melancholic person, as you know, <laughs> my moon child. And it's really helpful for me to have that, that I've trained so hard for so long, because now I can feel like I'm slowly shifting back into there and I can slowly shift myself back into a bit more neutral mode. And it's really helpful because I can do that with much more compassion than I used to. And I just don't judge myself for it. And I'm like, yeah, you're being unclear. It's okay. You're being a little moon. How about we bring you back to the sunshine tomorrow? The sun will be up and you're still going to be here. And it's just nice because you know, life is life. There's always going to be a bit of everything. <laughs> so yeah. 
that's good. I think it's healthy to remember that. It's not always going to be 100% happy, positive emotions all the time. Like when you recover, you're still going to be feeling those negative emotions at times. It's so interesting. Apparently the research shows that the people who are the happiest are actually the people who are the most aware and in tune and in touch with all the crap bits of life too. It's like so interesting because like Honestly, they're like, I completely believe that because I know so many people who avoid their emotions, especially the negative crap bits about life. And they're just miserable because they're not in control of it. Like they're not facing it. Mm -hmm. I always see it as, and I'm talking to you while looking at my painting on the wall, but like, and this is why I thought of it. You know, if you put like a bunch of colors, you know, and you sort of make a stripe or a blob or whatever of a bunch of colors, it's like, wow, yellow, green, pink, red, brown, black, whatever. But if you mix everything, it's all going to be gray going to be a big gray blob <laughs> that's when you don't feel emotions and you can't like say what is what it's you, you're ending up like my insides were a big gray blob and it just felt gray and black and now it's not that I don't have the black and the deep blue and the weird colors that I don't like so much it's that I can recognize those and I can recognize the yellow and the white and the pink and the happy orange and whatever also, I love that. It's such a nice visual too, because you see the richness of the awareness of your emotions, right? Like mm -hmm. you have the potential to transform your life from a gray blob into a beautiful, colorful painting. If you have the bravery and courage to feel your emotions, build awareness around them, embrace them non-judgmentally, right? So mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Well, it's colorful. I don't know if it's beautiful, but it, it is for sure colorful. It's beautiful, Anne Claire. It's beautiful. But yeah, so that was me. Oh, thanks for sharing. You're welcome. I, this was a good topic today. I think we kind of covered two, well, two interesting topics plus sleep. <laughs> And Woo. I think that wraps it up for today. Absolutely. I think so too, partner. Well, I hope you have a nice weekend and Thanks. I hope you enjoy your trip to Finland. How the are week. they doing? The gums? I know you shared with the group last time. Yeah, it's through. doing better. So I can like eat much more freely. I can like honor my taste hunger and actually have what I feel like having now and not be like, but I can't have this. <laughs> so I'm a much happier human. <laughs> Good. I still have like, you know, the stitches, whatever is still healing, but it's not impeding my uh, lifestyle anymore. <laughs> Beautiful. So. Beautiful. Well, Thank all right, Anne Claire, I hope you have a nice weekend. Thank you for everything. Love you. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Bye.